Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Bob Derenbacher, and it's my pleasure to serve as Dean at uh, Trinity College Theological School. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, by acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of the lands on which Trinity College is located, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present, and we recommit ourselves to the ongoing work of reconciliation. Again, welcome everyone to this uh, lunchtime uh, Zoom seminar. It's now my privilege uh, to turn things over to our moderator for the hour, uh, Dr. Scott Kirkland, the John and Jean Stockdale Senior Lecturer in Practical Theology and Ethics at Trinity College Theological School. So over to you, Scott. Thanks, Bob. Uh, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, as, you, as you know, my name's Scott Kirkland. Uh, and, I, and I'm the Stockdale Lecturer uh, in Practical Theology and Ethics here at Trinity. Um, and while this is uh, part of our usual lunchtime seminar series, which I believe uh, a number of you have been participating in, uh, this particular converse, conversation has been provoked by a, a project uh, grant that uh, is titled Figuring the Enemy, and it's jointly funded by the University of Divinity and Trinity College. Uh, it's being led by myself and uh, Dr. Chris Porter, who's our postdoctoral research fellow. Uh, and we have a wonderful team of Australian and international scholars joining us. Uh, the project's interested in talking about enemies uh, and enmity. So we're interested in what produces forms of enmity, what the category, the enemy, is conceptually loaded with. Uh, and what perhaps might be the conditions for overcoming enmity. So please do watch out for events over the coming couple of years as we undertake research, but also try to uh, make the fruits of that research available to wider audiences. So we anticipate having a number of visiting scholars, public events and conversations over the next couple of years, um, and we'd love for you to continue to be involved. So there's a project website, uh, figuringtheenemy.com, as well as a Facebook and Twitter page where you can follow along uh, and watch out for events. So the format for today is that I'll ask our speakers who I'll introduce in a moment a series of questions over the next half hour or so. Uh, and then hopefully we'll open it up for questions from the audience. So please, if you have a question, uh, or if a question comes up as we're, as we're speaking, um, please type it in the chat and send it to me. Uh, we'll endeavor to get through as many as possible. Uh, but of course, we only have an hour. So today we have uh, three wonderful guests with us. Uh, rabbi Fred Morgan, who's the Emeritus Rabbi at Temple Beth Israel and is formerly a professorial fellow at uh, Australian Catholic University. Uh, we have Dr. Susan Carland, a sociologist specializing in gender and Islam and a DECRA fellow at Monash University. And Dr. Aaron Galoni, a scholar of religion and theology and the current director of the St. James Institute in Sydney. So welcome everyone. Uh, it's lovely to have you with us and we're really grateful for your willingness to participate in this conversation. So, uh, Perhaps beginning with Aaron and to start with some of the basics. Um, what are the factors generally that you think uh, either historically or in the present give rise to antagonisms between religious communities? Thanks for inviting me to be part of today's conversation. And it's great to, to be along with Susan and Fred. Um, I'll only speak my own observations, I can't speak for the entire Christian community. Um, but I guess when I saw this question, my mind was drawn to intra-religious conflicts. Christians are quite skilled and practice at disagreeing with their co-religionists. Um, Christians can talk a big game about common ground and finding, um, finding common ground and fellow feeling with other religious traditions. Uh, but when it comes to our own, uh, we sharpen our teeth, we sharpen our knives, we're less exercised in compromise, in pragmatism, in finding a third way 
together. Uh, within Christianity, denominationalism, the continual creation of new brands of churches is rife. And it's as if um, schism is incentivized, that enmity is rewarded by proving that one's own church is the best kind of church. So we sort of do ourselves a disservice by kind of increasing antagonism amongst ourselves. Hmm. Thanks, Aaron. That's interesting. Uh, Susan, if I can turn to you. Thank you. And it is so great to be here, um, particularly with the esteemed guests on the panel. Um, when I first thought about this question, I guess I started to wonder, well, what are the factors of general um, discrimination more broadly? What, you know, leaving religion aside, what causes groups of people based on anything to um, be antagonistic towards each other? Mm. Um, you know, I, I, think that's, I think that's relevant because um, absolutely there are obviously antagonisms between religious communities, within religious communities, as Aaron has said. Um, and antagonisms, I think, can certainly take a religious flavour. We will use religious justifications um, or have religious motivations for our antagonisms. But, you know, when we look at the broader human condition of antagonism between us, they often will come down to the same similar things of um, competition over resources, over power, you know, within resources is land and gold, women, and um, all of these things. And I think religion will play a role in that and does has played a role in that sometimes, but it's also sometimes just a, a useful vehicle for uh, perpetuating these conflicts as well. And then, of course, I think... Um, you know, when we take it down another level, when we think about religious antagonisms between religious communities, they, they can be very different when one religious group is powerful and one is the minority or, or less powerful. Um, or are they between two equally powerful religious groups? Um, is it a non-religious group uh, having enmity towards a religious group, how is that different? What does that look like? So I think there are, you know, additional categories that can then fall within that that can make it, they are harder to tease out, but I think there are some key or core factors that we will find in antagonisms between groups of people, whoever they are, um, no matter no matter what the, the reason for these groupings are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Fred. Yes, I'd also like to thank you for inviting me, Scott, because I, I think this is a great opportunity to share uh, among us. Um, and one of the areas I'm particularly interested in is uh, interreligious dialogue. Um, so hearing people from different religious uh, perspectives speak on this topic is, is really valuable. And I really like what, uh, what both uh, Susan and Aaron have spoken about. We certainly have our intra-religious conflicts uh, within the Jewish community um, that other people don't hear much about, but we live with them all the time uh, and they represent enmity uh, to us very often. Um, I like the, uh, the, uh, to think about this in the way that Susan is. I, I'm, I tend to think about religions as cultural entities. Um, rather than expressions of divine truths. Uh, there, are, there are human ways to capture the, the meaning of religious experience, if you like. Um, and so uh, uh, as cultural entities, they can be uh, weaponized in the same way that other elements of culture can be weaponized. So this is basically agreeing with what Susan has said very much um, that uh, religions are often used as, as uh, weapons in conflict um, because they're available to people. But I'd like to add a, another component and that is speaking from a Jewish perspective that to us, um, his, history is very important too in determining the nature of, of inter-religious enmity. Um, 
you know, uh, Jewish people never have any trouble with uh, Buddhists or Hindus or Sikhs because we've had very little to do with them historically. So where there's very little con contact, there's also very little conflict. Um, uh, and we can talk about other religions as such as Hinduism or Buddhism without any problem. Hindus and Buddhists, however, have more difficulty speaking about one another because they've been in very close proximity. Uh, and indeed, Buddhism, some would say, grew out of Hinduism. So there's a real conflict there. Uh, and our, our history over the past 2000 years uh, has been one of, of intermittent enmity uh, with the other two religions, which are often called Abrahamic, because we are in constant proximity with one another. Uh, and I think that proximity can lead to a sense of threat as well, um, and hence to enmity. Um, so the challenge there is to build up a, a, a feeling of trust, um, which, is, which is really, really, to my way of thinking, at the heart of the problem. Um, how does one trust the other? Thank you, thank you. Um, it's, those are all really interesting answers. I mean, it strikes me that one of the um, one of the things that makes uh, speaking about uh, sort of religious enmity uh, as a kind of discrete form of enmity uh, is precisely the category religion in a certain sense, right? Uh, well, what do we mean by religion? Is this a, you know, uh, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, are they all discrete kind of species of a, of a kind, right? You know, or, or are they actually um, uh, like uh, Rabbi Fred is suggesting, uh, generated out of, uh, out of actually histories of proximity and, and dialogue and, and, and conflict, right? Um, of, of contest over, over the kinds of um, material conditions of, of human life. Um, I wonder if that might sort of helpfully lead us into, into the next question I had, which was, um, I wonder what you think some of the factors in contemporary Australian life um, that, might, uh, that might enhance uh, antagonism between religious communities. Um, maybe I'll come back to Aaron. Again. Sure. I'm quite interested in what Susan and Fred had to say and the other answers. It's uh, great to be, um, to have this discussion. Um, I guess when you asked this question, thought, Scott, I thought about how religion is covered in the media. So the question is about contemporary Australian life and we tend to all consume a lot of media these days. And uh, while I'm painting a broad brush, there's a generally low level of religious literacy among journalists, um, particularly religious literacy outside of Christianity. Um, so we know that there's polarization in our culture. We're polarized politically, we're polarized socially. And I think that polarization provides a ready-made map for how religious conflict is described and normalized. So the culture wars and the rhetoric around culture wars is like catnip to the media when trying to describe religion. Um, but in fact, conflict is a normal thing. It's a normal part of human experience. And many religious differences um, are not about civil conflicts or about burning people at the stake, but rather about genuine human dissimilarity, that dissimilarity can have a positive function in helping us clarify what's true and what we believe. And negotiating these differences can be good and can be moral. So I think there's a kind of low level heat in the struggle that keeps us engaged in interpreting and applying our own religious traditions to uh, the modern world. And you'd love to see that kind of nuance and complexity uh, represented in the media. 
Yeah, very much so. Um, Susan, looking. Mm. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree that the media plays a massive role um, in this, and I also agree there's um, shockingly, scandalously low levels of religious literacy in Australia. Um, I think, yeah, you're right, there's, you know, a fair amount of literacy about Christianity, um, but, you know, what people know about uh, Islam, which is the religion that I belong to, is <laughs> atrociously low. No doubt, similarly for Judaism and, you know, Buddhism, Hinduism, apart from, you know, the odd trope. I think um, one of the things that I think is significant uh, and sorry, as well as media comments, I think political comments can make a, a significant impact on the temperature for religious communities in Australia. Again, I can only speak from the perspective of, of myself as a Muslim and what it's like to be in the Muslim community. But I know when political leaders have in the last, you know, 20 odd years um, made comments about Muslims, how the significant change that has in our experience of our everyday lives, the way people will interact with us, the increase in Islamophobic attacks, those kind of things. So those things make a difference. But I think when we think about the way Australia deals with its, its communities, there's a, there was this really great research done by a woman called Susan Fisk who's a social psychologist, some of you might have heard about this, where she did this research that, that found that when we stereotype or discriminate or have prejudice against people, we're always judging gr these groups of people based on how warm we think they are and how competent they, we think they are. And every stereotypical group gets put into, in, is categorised in this. So, for example, the elderly, we, we see them as very warm, so they're very sincere and sociable, but we, they, we think they're very cold. Uh, sorry, they're warm, but we think they're in competent uh, because we think they're not that capable and intelligent um, you know when you ask the average American white middle class Americans are seen as very warm and very capable um, other groups are seen at like the homeless are seen as incapable and cold so everyone is categorized in these in categories um, Rabbi Fred uh, you may already know this perhaps you won't be surprised if you don't to know that um, in Australia and in the US Jewish people are seen as competent but as cold. Um, and Asian uh, Australians and Asian Americans are also seen as competent and cold. And the problem with this, and the reason I bring this up, is when we have these views, these sort of these boxes of competence and warmth um, as the way we frame people, when external political, environmental health things happen, this has a direct impact on how we relate to those groups. So, for example, Asian Australians being seen as competent and cold was catastrophic in the way we thought about them during COVID. Because when you're seen as um, competent and cold, you're seen as quite calculating, you're seen as a threat because you have the power to do something wrong if you want to. Um, but we don't trust you, like you were saying, um, Rabbi, about there's this, this lack of trust. Um, and we can see other horrific instances where the way Jewish people have been perceived socially in those categories, the terrible outcomes that that has. So I think thinking about these frames of reference, you'll be, you won't be you will be surprised at all that Muslims are seen as uh, cold and incompetent in Australia. It didn't surprise me at all. Um, when we have these categories of, of prejudice, this is then the, the, the frame of reference we fall back on when things happen to understand the role that these people play. And then we'll then create specifically religious and, you know, antagonisms. It's, you know, other religious groups will feel those things too. Obviously, how a, a Muslim in Saudi Arabia thinks about Muslims is, of course, you know, they think they're very capable and very warm. So, of course, it, it's, it's context specific. But when we think about Australia, it is worth us thinking about these categories because they're a frame that we will then import to every social, political, cultural, environmental um, impact that happens here. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. And so I would introduce to that the, the thinking of Martin Buber about I, it, and I, thou relationships. So in an I, it, the, the other is object, is treated as object. Um, he doesn't say that's a bad thing. I mean, we, most of our in, interactions with the world are in terms of I and, and it, subject, object. That's how we get on in the world and do things and manage to... to um, uh, to actually uh, achieve things. But they can be very negative if the it is stereotyped, which is really what you're describing, Susan. So 
uh, anti-Semitism is like a, an ultimate form within the Jewish, as seen by the Jewish community, of stereotyping. You, you, you couldn't, uh, uh, the anti-Semite cannot uh, act the way they do without typically turning the, the Jewish person into an it, uh, an object which can then be manipulated um, and which doesn't have to be encountered on a personal level. Mm. And I'm sure that's true of anti-Islamic or anti-Muslim feeling and that indeed anti-Christian feeling today. Mm. I know that there's a lot of anti-Christian feeling out there as well. I mean, the, the the party that's missing from this discussion and is so often missing from these kinds of discussions is the secularist, mm. you know, or the eighth, if you will, the secular humanist or ex extreme humanist atheist um, who uh, really sees religion as, as a problem um, in, in, every, in every dimension and can only do that really by not talking to religious people because if you begin to talk to religious people, you begin to understand what motivates them and you begin to see them as individuals, not as types. And, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of enmity can only uh, succeed if we s subtract the humanity from the other person. So we, you know, they become the enemy, that's a type uh, as well. Uh, and I, I think that the, I, I agree with what Aaron said and, and Susan um, also said that the media is pro very problematic here because the media seems to survive mainly on conflict. You know, that's, that's what's newsworthy, conflict. Um, uh, an, act, uh, an act of kindness occasionally makes it into the media, thank heaven, but not very often. Usually it's, it's the other uh, that makes it into the media. So that's a big problem. The media basically politicizes religion. And it, it doesn't, it, it, I, I can't, apart from a, a, a few instances, I can't think of media writers who've written about religion in terms of experience or in mm. terms of deepening appreciation for the world or for other people, or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I do know some people who do that. Rachel Kahn, I felt, used to do that. She had a tremendous empathy uh, and sense of trust uh, in others. But it just doesn't happen that often. Rather, it's that um, stereotyping and then conflict building character of the media that uh, I think is a problem. Can I mention one other thing about living in Australia? I think one of the benefits here, because I didn't, I'm, clearly not from Australia originally. Um, one of the benefits of living here is that we're so far away from other people and, and conflicts in other places. Mm. So we can, we can, I think we have the ability here in Australia to, to remove ourselves from some of the conflicts which are so immediate elsewhere in the world and, and consider the other with greater trust. You can't do that if you're in a hot spot of conflict. It was much harder to do that, certainly. But I think we, we do have the potential for doing that. And, and actually, I don't feel a great deal of, of enmity among religions here in Australia. Maybe that's why Aaron started by looking within mm -hmm. Christianity rather than among the religions. I think the religions here are more interested in, in in one another, um, not the secular necessarily, you know, the secular society, but the religious societies themselves, the religious communities are more interested here in one another than they are in many other parts of the world. Thank you. I think it's interesting that um, Aaron and well, all of you have, uh, have turned to um, media and, and politics, these kinds of two sites of, you know, Sort of mediation, but also of of, um, uh, of representation, where you know um, um, where sort of 
images are produced of communities or figures are asked to sort of somehow you know stand for an entire complex group of people and histories um and then you know this becomes the way in which uh, strangely we perhaps encounter other traditions uh, in and through this kind of mediation without necessarily engaging in um as you know, Rabbi Fred alluded to uh, or referenced uh, Martin Buber it, without actually you know, encountering one another face to face, um, which I suppose is you know rather odd to say over Zoom. But um, <laughs> um, but I wonder, um, you know, given what you've all said so far, um, if we could maybe think a little bit about the way that. Um, uh, religious antagonisms maybe intersect with other forms of conflict or struggle. Um, uh, and and, and if, if, if indeed it does, um, what are these and how do they complicate our pictures of religious communities? Um, you know, Rabbi Fred, you, you said that uh, often there's, there's not sort of overt conflict between um, religious communities in Australia, but perhaps Perhaps these kinds of conflicts uh, take place in and through other forms of conflict. If we come back to you know where we began as well with Susan's complicating of uh, of the picture of really, you know distinctly religious enmity. Um, so well, I, uh, might, I might distinguish between uh, a, a religion, which is a mm -hmm. I don't know a set of ideas. Of uh, practices, institutions, all that kind of thing, and and the people themselves. And I don't think any anyone in in this society would be per particularly inclined nowadays to attack Judaism, mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. the early church attacked. Uh, some of the church fathers mm -hmm. attacked Judaism. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, nowadays people, uh, you're that's a set of beliefs or practices and that's your business and because religion is that that side of religion has become very privatized i think you know with the enlightenment with moses mendelssohn and everything that came after after him in the late 1700s religion is a privatized affair so judaism that's what what you do in the privacy of your home or in your synagogue and that doesn't worry us it's, it's you as a person that I worry about. So it's, it's the Jew or the Muslim or the Christian. Um, what's your place in our society? Do you really belong here? You know, are, you, are you really Australian? Are you really, a, can you be a mate uh, to use a, a peculiar expression? You know, the, these become, I think, the, the key issues. I don't, I don't know that people would worry about Islam as a religious set of, a set of religious practices or a faith structure, but I think they worry about Muslims. I don't think Christianity, uh, you know, is so significant, but I think Christians maybe. I wonder, I wonder what Aaron and Susan think about that. Is that part of your experience? You go, Aaron. That's a really big question. I, I do think there's, I think Islamophobia is real in, in Australia. And I think it can, well, I think it can work in reverse that people can have a caricature of, of a religion, in this case, say Islam, and can map that onto anyone they deem to be Muslim. I think in polite conversation and you know educated conversation like we might have at the university, I think you're right, Rabbi Fred, that people would say, oh, any religious or cultural belief system, that's fine. It's, you know, that's, it, that's what you choose. So I'd like to hear a bit more, you know, how you, I haven't experienced it the way what, what you've experienced. I have to say that people seem to have a real problem with Islam. 
is my experience. Um, and they have a problem with Muslims because of the Islam. And I wonder if it's part of what you said, Rabbi, is that it's, you know, religion is seen as a private thing and you do what you want in your home and your synagogue. Whereas I think the, the attitude about Muslims in my experience and my research is it's the, there is this belief that we are encroaching. So we are in, always trying to take it out of the private and put it into the public. So they think we're trying to enforce halal food on people. They don't like seeing us in our hijabs and they think, you know, if we had our way, you know, and if we took over, which could happen at any minute, um, we're going to make every woman wear a hijab or worse, um, that it, it's that it's not a private thing and that is the problem. And what they think they know about Islam, which is, of course, you know, mostly wrong or, you know, only a tiny snippet, seems terrible to them. So I think, and I, I do wonder if, you know, because of political events, September 11, wars, terrorist attacks here and overseas, at this point, I wonder if Islam does play a unique role of threat in Australian society and maybe other Western countries as well um, that people are genuinely fearful about. Um, and so they are genuinely fearful about Muslims as well. They see the religion itself as a threat. That's, that's uh, making me realise that, of course, uh, the Jewish community is, is minute. Is very, very small, globally and within Australia. It's less than half of 1% of the population. I don't think people realize that very often. If you ask them, how many Jewish people are there in Australia, they might say, I don't know, 5%. Actually, I think that's closer to the, the Muslim population. The Muslim population is probably about 2.5%. Yeah, 2.6%. 2.6, almost had it spot on. <laughs> um, and, and even that's very small. Yes. Uh, but it's seen in a much, uh, oh, yeah. as a much bigger thing. I, it's funny, you know, I do a lot of public speaking and <laughs> one of the questions I ask a lot of the audience is what percentage of Australia do you think is Muslim? And regularly, without fail, even in educated audiences, the answers are 10%, 20%, 30%. I had one woman say 50%. Like, lady, look around. We are not half of this room. But there is, and I think it's part of this fear of this encroaching threat that there are so many Muslims. And what's particularly tricky for me in dealing with that is I know from other research that's been done, you know, you ask a focus group, what percentage of Australia do you think is a Muslim? They're like, oh, I don't know, 40%. And we go, well, actually, here, here's the census data. It's actually only 2.6%. There's only about 600,000 Muslims in Australia. You know, what do you think now? And what's really interesting is how often they say, no, no, I, I still think it's about 30%. <laughs> this belief is really baked in. Um, and I think, you know, when, when fear is attached to something, it, it exacerbates that. Scott, it's, can... a, yeah. it's certainly a figure within anti-Semitism as well. Yeah. Because, yeah. Uh, the, how should I put it? Uh, the Jewish population seems to have a media presence larger mm -hmm. than, you know, it really is. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, it'd be, for whatever reason that is, uh, people, uh, and this is, this is true throughout uh, Western European history, people have seen Jews as a threat, but, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, it's it's it, that's not a real that's not real it's uh, imaginary. Mm. Yeah. Sorry, Aaron. Um, no, I, I just want to take the risk of saying something hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think Scott, your question was about how are there other forms of conflict that religious antagonism might kind of become a proxy for, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I guess you meant like racial conflict or political conflict, mm -hmm. uh, other things. But, but some of these cultural conflicts can be a place where religions unite to have a common voice. Yeah. So around things like the environment or Black Lives Matter in the US or something, you see you know, people from the monotheistic faiths coming together um, to work together towards these things, to, to resist or, or to form a particular kind of conflict um, from their shared religious identity. So I, I think that it works both ways. 
Mm. No, I think that that's really uh, it's really helpful. Um, I mean, one of the one of the things that struck me is um, as we were all talking there is that uh, there's something kind of historically interesting in that the perhaps um, the encounter between Christianity and Islam is a in many ways a political encounter, right? Um, historically, in a way that. Uh, the relationship between what becomes Christianity and Judaism is not overtly at first. It's a it's a it's a conflict that takes place within you know Jewish communities, but then as as Gentiles are welcomed in, and the, the different kinds of characters of those encounters, I wonder if they they sort of persist with uh, these kinds of nominally secular Western nations in different ways, and that you know the uh, anti-Semitism often takes the shape of a uh, you know, the, 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 the Jew is often cast as a kind of internal threat um, to, to political order. Uh, and, and, and often Islam is thought of as a, you know, as a kind of looming political threat, uh, quite overtly, you know, kind of violent encounter. Um, I, don't, I don't know, it just sort of strikes me that that, um, that kind of difference seems to persist in a, in a strange way. Um, uh, I wonder, um, picking up um, on maybe Aaron's um, hopeful note there, <laughs> um, <laughs> that you're all in one way or another uh, involved in education, um, and we're often told, you know, that um, the remedy to, to forms of antagonism and violence in our communities is is education, and it's often a kind of offhand sort of. Well, if people just understood, you know, um, then. Although you know, uh, Susan's uh, <laughs> anecdote um, mm. uh, just before would seem to indicate that there's maybe something a little more that needs to take place. Um, but how do you how do you understand the role of religious education in Australia um, for generating forms of understanding and and peacefulness. Um, maybe I'll start with Susan. Um, this is a really tricky one. And I think maybe I'm at a point of, unfortunately, sorry, Aaron, you're going to have to carry the hope. Um, I'm at a bit of a point of despair, um, simply because of where I'm at with my research. I'm doing this big research on how do we, how do we change some of these attitudes? And <laughs> The more I dig, the worse it gets. The more we um, we seem to find things that we were relying on and thought were useful, like for example, implicit bias training. Um, you know, I'm sure we've all heard about. You know, we all have implicit bias, and you can do training. Workplaces often have them to try to eradicate it. It turns out there's zero evidence that implicit bias training works, does anything. In fact, it could actually make people more racist. It encourages people to dig their heels. And kind of like that example I was giving when people said, "No, no." I'm sure it's still 30%. When we are presented with information that goes against what we believe and particularly in a way that makes us feel like you're being told that you're a racist or you're a bigot or, or whatever, we can actually dig our heels in. Um, you know, there's another theory that's meant to work, which is contact theory. If we just get to know each other as people, um, which could work, the tricky thing for me as a Muslim, and perhaps it's the same for you, Rabbi, is as we talked about, there are so few Muslims in Australia. There are so few Jewish people in Australia. So that means the vast majority of Australians will never have a Muslim friend, colleague or neighbour. They just won't. So their main source of information about Islam and Muslims is the media, which we've already talked about. Um, so, you know, that, that's a tricky one as well. I will say, I think people can really sort of, um, well, some people can sort of poo-poo into faith. Oh, you're just preaching to the converted. I actually really disagree with that. I, I really do think there is a role for the events. You know, we have events like Mosque Open Day or I don't know, maybe you have synagogue open day, church open day, whatever it is. And you're like, yeah, but the people that come, they're the people that are open anyway. But having attended many mosque open days and perhaps it's the same, you know, similar things in, in your communities, um, people come, you know, first of all, some people come who are not open minded. They come to cause problems, but people will come open minded and they still have horrifically wrong ideas about what it means to be a Muslim or um, what Islam teaches. So these things 
do still actually really play a role. And I don't think we should just dismiss the people who are open and willing to come to these things as irrelevant. I think that can actually be where some of the best work can be done because I also think we need to accept that some people will, and I think it's a small percentage, but I think a small percentage of people probably just won't change their minds. And while that might sound quite negative, I don't think it has to be. There was something Joe Biden said in his inauguration speech, which I realise is quite an aside, but he mentioned, he was talking about how in America, you know, things like slavery ended because enough people believe that this was the right thing to do. And, you know, other rights, so, you know, civil rights that happened in, in America. And I think that's actually a really important idea that we just need enough people to come on board with these things for, for us to see genuine social change. Um, so I think if we even if we do keep preaching to the converted, quote unquote, I actually think that's a really important group where really important deep work um, can be done. Thank you. Um, Aaron. Sure. So I'd like to answer the question about religious education in two ways because of sort of two parts of my professional work as someone who lectures in a studies in religion department in a, a secular university and then someone who works as a religious educator. So I know we're here as part of Trinity College Theological School, University of Divinity but I'd like to give a shout out for the academic study of religion that doesn't come from a confessional or theological point of view. Um, studies in religion helps us to understand religions, plural, uh, critically and pluralistically. It gives us an important kind of distance through sociology, the type of work Susan does, uh, through anthropology, through history, that we just may not be able to access at a divinity school through an insider's view. Um, so there's kind of a decentering that takes place in that kind of environment. And even though a nuanced, modern, progressive uh, theological view has a lot to going for it, it may not uh, give us the critical distance from our tradition to see our own blind spots, to see ourselves the way others might see us. So that's, that's the one hat. The other hat is my work as a religious educator and um, I associate editor of an international journal of religious education and religious educators, education scholars are talking more and more uh, about how interfaith education needs to proceed interfaith dialogue. Um, they talk about learning from rather than just learning about. So Susan was describing how just learning some things at an HR seminar doesn't always, the, the learning about or the learning it, to use the Martin Buber terminology, doesn't always move the, the needle. So it's the learning from. So the practice of interreligious education is not just about understanding new texts or getting new terminology, but about seeing diversity as part of our own moral growth. So being taken to new levels of our faith by uh, learning in the presence of others who are different than us. So at the St. James Institute, we tried to do some of this kind of decentering work and learning from through uh, seminars with Muslim colleagues where we, we, we did things like a Christian's view of the Quran and a Muslim's view of the Bible. So rather than Christians explaining to Muslims about the Bible and Muslims explaining to Christians about the Quran, to kind of flip that, mm. and we've got a seminar coming up next year, a Christian's view of Muhammad and a Muslim's view of Jesus, mm. kind of follow along mm. with that. Mm. So try to put us in different perspectives um, with regard to each other and with regard to ourselves. Thanks, that's mm. fascinating. Um, yeah, I... I I like very much uh, the things that you just said, Aaron, and I think I've always felt that it was a big mistake for religion to go out of school's curricula, uh, but that was confessional religion. I, I agreed with that. I didn't think confessional religion should be taught in non-religious schools, but I felt the religion should because it's a basic cultural fact. I mean, apart from anything else, how can you understand Shakespeare without learning something about 
Christianity you know, um, and the Bible and so forth. So uh, I, I've always felt really uh, disappointed that the school systems have taken religion out of, out of their curriculum, but that is teaching about, uh, and it doesn't get to the heart of the matter, which is how are religious people inspired uh, by their understanding of their own religious faith and community uh, to engage with the world and with other people in positive ways. I mean, ultimately that's, that's what it's about for me. And I, I think um, the only way that, that, that people can grasp that is by hearing from religious people who are so inspired, how they are inspired, you know, why they're moved. Uh, if, I, if I engage in some sort of charitable action, I do it as a Jewish person. I don't do it as a, a human being. I could do it as a human being, but I don't. I, because my Jewishness is so intrinsic to who I am and all I do. So I will define it in those terms. And I want other people to hear that. And the only way they're going to hear that is if they actually are interested enough to sit down and chat with me about mm. it. And then we run into Susan's problem, which is there aren't enough of me to go around. You know, there just aren't enough Jewish people to, to go around. And, as, and, and indeed, as soon as you leave the big cities like Melbourne and you, you go out to Shepparton, Geelong or uh, Ballarat or Bendigo, there are Jewish people who live in these places, but there are so few. And, and generally they're very un, uh, disconnected from the religion, not all, but, but generally speaking. Uh, and that leads me to another point that uh, some Jewish scholars have made, very, which is very important, I think that only someone who's really uh, engaged with their religious tradition uh, can be a, a good ambassador for their religious tradition. Mm -hmm. And this is really problematic. Um, so who becomes a spokesman for, mm -hmm. for Judaism or for Islam or for Christianity? Uh, in Christianity, for example, is it, the, is it a Catholic? Is it an evangelical? Is it a... Uh, uniting church person, who, who's the spokesperson? Uh, so in, in all of these kinds of learnings, um, we're, we're really challenged. Uh, and for that reason, I think we'll never achieve that kind of critical mass of understanding that, that might be required to overcome this image of religion as causing enmity. Can I add one last? Oh, sorry, go on. Scott. Please, no, go oh, ahead. Okay, okay. Please. I was going to add. I came across one. Perhaps the solution. Um, I don't know how many, any, how much anyone here is into sport, but there may be an unusual solution. I came across some fascinating research about any Liverpool soccer fans here. Funny oh. chance. Okay, Scott, get ready for this. <laughs> You could do a PhD on this. There is an amazing, arguably the world's best soccer player at the moment is a man called Mohamed Salah. He is from Egypt, practicing Muslim guy. He plays for Liverpool. Researchers did some fascinating research and found that Islamophobic hate crime dropped in Liverpool by nearly 20% since Salah joined the club. Other crimes hadn't, so it wasn't like suddenly everyone was happy and look, crime was going. It was specifically that. And also they found, the same researchers found that anti-Muslim or Islamophobic tweets were halved by Liverpool fans mm. since, and this is millions of tweets, mm. um, since Mohamed Salah was signed. So perhaps, uh, Rabbi, what you need to do is just get really good at sport. Um, <laughs> and that, we what we but it, I think it does raise an interesting point about the role of a cultural hero um, and and the impact that can have because Muhammad Salah is interesting in that he hardly ever talks like you know he might do the odd press conference but he doesn't really talk about his religion anything like that and yet just him being the most phenomenal soccer player has had this uh, impact I think there's maybe there's something in that that we could try to do something with <laughs> All for talking more about <laughs> Salah. <laughs> also, also uh, Sadio Mane uh, is is, uh, yep. is also is also Islamic. Um, um, 
Yeah, don't get me started on. Um, is, is that your other religion, Scott? We have a, <laughs> we, have a we have a question um, about uh, from Dorothy, uh, Dorothy Lee, um, about uh, maybe I'll, I'll come back to you, Susan, on this because um, it seems like it's it's right in your uh, wheelhouse. Um, what what role do gender issues have in this discussion? Mm. That's a great question. And I mean, I'd, lo I'd love to hear from Aaron and, and Rabbi as well on this. Um, I think it can form a really interesting, it, it can play this unusually tense role in where we can have terrible sexism in our own religious communities um, and yet be so angry about it in other religious communities. Um, oh, we're not like them and have you seen the way they treat their women and, and these things so we can we sort of weaponize um, suddenly we become feminists when we're talking about other people's religious practices and traditions while being really unwilling to talk about what's happening in our own religious community so I think it becomes a really useful Trojan horse um, I think that can be uh, that can be I think that can be a, a, a big part of it. And, you know, as so often in these cases with these things, discussions about sexism, um, we're, we're not hearing enough from the women in the religious communities about this and, and how they understand things and what these things mean to them, how they are fighting about back against sexism in their communities, perhaps our things that as a Western liberal perspective would see as oppressive, these women actually say, actually, I really like covering my hair, for example, and I don't see it as oppressive, for example. Um, yeah, anyway, I'll hand over to, to the blokes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what you've said is absolutely correct. I mean, I think uh, within the Jewish community, uh, many Orthodox women uh, would distinguish between sexism and gender roles. Uh, sexism is unacceptable, but gender roles are acceptable. Uh, they're very happy with with the role that they play, but but there are other there are women from other branches of Judaism who don't understand that. So within the religion, you also get uh, this kind of politicization of of, of feminism, and uh, it's a it's a, it's it is a, a huge a huge issue. Uh, and I and I take what you say about. Uh, uh, Criticizing, you know, the the person over there, but not see, seeing the beam in our own eye. Yeah, um, uh, and I I, I the, I've often been struck by that. Yes, within uh, even within the the Jewish community, you know, that the people do this. Um, but I think this is possibly um, again, it's part of human. It's, it's the human condition, it's human nature, it's how we act as human beings. To become self-critical is actually extremely difficult. Um, and, uh, and Aaron, this touches on what you were saying. How do we become self-critical? We can only do that by contrasting our own experience with someone else's, <laughs> comparing it and contrasting it. Um, uh, and that's how we learn about ourselves. We see what's missing. You know, Christopher Stendhal's holy envy thing. Well, we, we don't notice what we don't have until we notice somebody else has it. And then, and then maybe we can think about it in a much deeper kind of way. And uh, there are things that go on in, in other religions that I, I find uh, very important, and that, and this st stretches over into feminism as well. That, uh, that there are aspects of this in other people's religions that maybe I should be listening to more carefully. I really like Susan's phrase about we become feminists uh, on behalf of women in other religious communities, and I'll have to yeah. think on that more. Uh, there's a lot of truth in that, Susan. Um, from my own teaching, just in response to Dorothy's questions about gender issues, religion, and enmity, um, uh, the history of, uh, and this, this may seem odd for this discussion, but the history of witchcraft and witchcraft trials is really relevant, I think, to this discussion. Um, and, you know, maybe not something that's in your divinity school, in a divinity school curriculum, but the way that 
certain women were um, were um, stigmatized often by the most powerful religious men in the empire, including King James. Um, and it, I, I think those power dynamics, you, you know, kind of map on to this question of who is the enemy and, and how are they characterized and, and how can they go about being uh, defended or, you know, uh, unmasked as not being witches. Um, has a lot of relevance for our day. Isn't a lot of this about fear, really? Mm -hmm. You know, the fear of, of the unknown, the fear of the other who presents something that we don't understand. Uh, when I was engaged in religious studies more generally, we often spoke about how uh, uh, people, um, uh, in talking to those of other faiths, couldn't quite under, uh, understand how they could believe such things. You know, if I don't, if I don't believe it, how can they believe it? You know, it's not reasonable. It's not rational. Everybody else's belief is irrational, and mine yeah. is rational. <laughs> you know, and I, I think a lot of that goes into this whole enmity thing. You know, fear, fear of the unknown and the other, mm. and fear of what that might do to us. You know, that as they encroach on our space, we become very frightened. In the earlier days of feminism, and I'm old enough to be around in the earlier days of feminism, I recall how many men felt frightened by what women were saying, precisely for this reason, because it encroached on their space. What's gonna to happen to me? Where does my status go if, women do X, Y, and Z. And, and maybe that's at the heart of a lot of, uh, a lot of this. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to um, cut you off there. Um, and I'm sorry to anyone who's, uh, whose questions or comments we didn't get to. Um, but can I ask that you all, um, I don't know, use the reaction emoji thing or whatever. But thank, our, um, thank our three guests for so generously giving up their time to be with us today um, and for, uh, for what's been a really uh, fascinating uh, conversation. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. And thank you. Yeah. Scott, I learned a lot from Susan and Fred. That was great. The same here. Excellent. Well, I'll just hand back over to, to Bob. Um, who will uh, who will close for us? Uh, thank thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Susan, Fred, and Aaron for a really stimulating hour, which flew by so quickly. I wish we had all afternoon together to uh, to talk, uh, but I'm sure there'll be other opportunities. Uh, like uh, publicly funded television, we save our advertisements uh, for the uh, top and bottom of the hour. So uh, do uh, bear with me just for a moment, just to talk about a couple of things. Uh, coming up uh, this, uh, this November, in a couple of weeks, uh, Rochelle Gilmore and I will be uh, leading a Saturday seminar on uh, the year C readings uh, from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, so if you're interested in participating in this, it's all by Zoom, uh, please uh, do visit the website that you see on the slide here. And if you would like to learn more about any of our academic courses or uh, programming in theology, please uh, visit our virtual open house uh, for pr prospective students, which is on the Trinity College website. Take a look at that. I think it takes about a half an hour to watch the video. You'll get a tour of our campus and plus uh, learn more about our programming. So thank you again, everyone for attending. It's great to be with all of you. Again, thank you for our panelists, uh, Susan, Fred, and Aaron. Uh, as a small token of our appreciation, I'll be sending you a, a gift certificate for a, a bookstore uh, that's here in Melbourne. So hopefully, Aaron, you can utilize that as well through mail order uh, to populate your bookshelves with more books. So thanks again, everybody. Have a, a, a fantastic day, and we'll see you next time. All the best. <laughs>